Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus. To him be the glory always. Amen. I invite you to take out your notes and hopefully it would make a nice devotion during the week as well. We pray. Heavenly Father, we are so excited today uh, and we just we rejoice in who you are and what you've done for us. Give us open hearts, minds, and spirit to receive that joy in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, now I want us to, to get excited. I want us to say this so the neighbors can hear it, with a, and we're just filled with the joy and excitement of what we're saying. He is risen. He is risen. Hallelujah. Now, during Lent, uh, we looked at some of the places of passion that Jesus uh, went to, like uh, uh, the, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Judgment Hall of Pilate, Golgotha, and the, the cross, the, all places Jesus demonstrated his passion during the last week of his life on earth. And beloved, that last week, that final week of Jesus' life shows us just the depth of his passion and how far he would go to save us. God's love is most clearly seen in the gift of his son, Jesus. In fact, Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so today we're going to look again at those familiar verses from the book of Matthew about the resurrection of Jesus. Again, Matthew is so fascinating. Matthew uh, uh, is really trying to capture uh, some of the emotion of the moment. I mean, we know that women are going to the tomb uh, from the other Gospels to prepare Jesus' body, but, but Matthew has a little bit different take on it. And Matthew says that Mary, and Mary, Mary, went to the tomb to, to look at the tomb. And I read that and I think, uh, that's, that's grief. If you've ever lost a loved one, that, that's grief. They're just going to see the tomb. And while there, an, an angel came and said, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. Now, uh, have you ever experienced a time where you just know God is working in your life and he's leading you, and, and so there's this sense of overwhelming joy because you know God is doing something miraculous through you. And yet, at the same time, there's this, this overwhelming fear because it is so big and miraculous. That's what these women were experiencing on that first Easter day, afraid, but filled with joy. Matthew says, and they left the tomb quickly with fear and the great joy and ran and report to his disciples. And while they're going, Jesus meets them on the way. That's got to be just amazing. And he said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Now, uh, this is the second time that the women have been told to tell the disciples. Now, I am much too smart to make a joke about that. <laughs> I had to tell the women twice. You may notice my wife's not here because I've tried them on her. Uh, so, so twice they tell, they tell the disciples, go and meet Jesus in Galilee because you're not going to see a crucified Christ. You're not going to see a defeated Savior. You're going to see a, a risen Messiah, a risen Christ. Jesus is alive. And beloved, there are many different ways that we can talk about the resurrection of Jesus and what it means. But perhaps, just perhaps, the most important of all is that the resurrection of Jesus is not just some historical event that you can choose to believe or not believe. It's much more important than that. I mean, there are some who believe in the resurrection and, and, and that it's historically true, and there's a lot of evidence to, to prove that. But still, even though they've seen that, they're, they're not positive. They don't really know. They're, they're doubtful. They don't fully understand the meaning. And so it doesn't really change how they live. 
It doesn't make a difference in their life. Now, there are a lot of historical facts that are like that, that that don't really make a difference in our life. For example, a lot of people believe that man really landed on the moon. That's pretty exciting. Uh, and, And yet there are some who say, oh, that didn't really happen. It was just filmed in a sound studio. It's just kind of government propaganda. It doesn't really matter what you believe. It's not going to make a difference in how you live your life. There are a lot of people who believe that the Egyptians built the pyramids. They don't know how they did it. They're still trying to figure it out, but, but they believe the Egyptians did it. And then there are others who believe aliens built them. I have watched the documentary Stargate. And uh, I'm tending, you know, whatever. Uh, but it doesn't matter because it's not going to really change the way you live. Thank you for getting that. Uh, uh, but, but that's not the case with the resurrection. The resurrection is so much different than that. If, if you believe in the resurrection, if you understand what it truly means, then it will absolutely change the way you live your life. And there are lots of different ways it's going to impact the way you live. But let me give you just a couple. Uh, The resurrection empowers you to do things that you never thought you could do. After the resurrection, (laughs) uh, Jesus tells 11 disciples to go and meet him in Galilee. Now, uh, there were 12. There's only 11 now. There were 12. But one of the original 12, Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And uh, realizing what he had done, he was, he was so overcome with guilt and shame uh, that uh, uh, he even said, I have sinned against innocent blood, that, that, that he just went out and he killed himself. He did this before he had a chance to see the resurrected Savior who would have joyfully and freely forgiven him just as he had forgiven Peter, when Peter betrayed him. And so Jesus meets with his disciples. And and this is how the Gospel of Matthew closes. It says, But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some were doubtful. Now, uh, you need to understand, there were more than just eleven people gathered. More than just eleven people gathered. Uh, Jesus had a huge following. The 11 believed. There were other followers who doubted, even after seeing the resurrected uh, Jesus. You know, we we hear that seeing is believing, but we know that's not always true. They saw and they doubted. They, They saw the resurrected Jesus, but it didn't make any difference in their life. Even after seeing him alive and hearing him teach, they, they just struggled because they didn't fully understand the meaning of his resurrection. And then, the very last thing Jesus said before he returned back to his heavenly throne, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And though I am with you always, even to the end of the age, Now, we have heard this so many times that sometimes we miss how huge this is, what's going on. This is amazing. This group of uneducated men who had spent the last three and a half years with Jesus wondering, what does this mean? What's going to happen to us? What are we going to do now? Jesus tells them what they're going to do for the rest of their life. He says, you're going to go and change the world. You are going to go and tell everybody the good news of salvation in Christ. You're going to tell them and how much God loves them and, and what God has done for them. And the exciting part of all this is, is that, that some are going to believe and get baptized. And, and God's going to use these guys to be world changers. Now, for 40 days uh, after Jesus rose from the dead, for 40 days, these guys uh, hid behind locked doors. I, they were always excited to see Jesus, but they were keeping their faith quiet. They're keeping it to themselves. And, and like the women earlier, 
And so often, like you and like me, God calls them to do something wild. And they are excited and they're afraid. No, I'm not qualified. I can't do this. I, I, I'm not a world changer. I, I don't know enough. I, I've not been to enough of Sue Steggy's classes. Uh, and, and I imagine these guys hear this and, and they're a little freaked out by this. I, I doubt any of them had been outside of Israel. And now Jesus says, you're going to go to all the nations. Uh, and the difference for this, the difference is the promise in verse 20. And I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That, that you're not going to be going out on your own. I am going to walk with you every step of the way. Now, what would you do, beloved? What would you do if you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was with you wherever you go? How would that change your confidence? How would that impact your boldness and your courage? What difference would it make to know that the God of the universe, the creator of God, the all-powerful, almighty, all-knowing, living God is with you every step uh, of every day of your life? What, What could you do then? What would you do? Think about it like this. (laughs) <laughs> if you were starting a business and Jeff Bezos or Mark Cuban said that they believe in you and they're going to invest in you and they're going to back you and, and, and they have promised that they will pull, put their full weight of resources behind you. We call that Shark Tank. Uh, and which is kind of sometimes, sometimes inter- interesting. You know, they, they, they will often back Someone, not just because it's a good idea, but they, they see the potential, and, and, and so they back him. Now, what must that do for these people's confidence? What must it do for their boldness and the belief in what can happen? Beloved, Jesus believes in you. He took all our sin, all our failures, all our brokenness to the cross and died in our place. And then Jesus rose from the dead because even death couldn't hold him. That he is the living God who has defeated the power of sin and death and the devil. And now he has called you and me to be world changers. And he said that he would back us and that, that, he, that the creator God, Jesus, he said the full weight of all his resources are at our disposal. And he is with us 100% every moment, every day, backing us to the very end of the age. God wants you to change your world, whatever that may look like. He wants you to share his love with the people around you and use you to transform your world uh, by just, just one life at a time, by, by his power, not your power, his power. And, and that he's with you, giving you his full backing, his full support. And, and Paul got this. Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God, God's the one who gives the growth. Now, on so the basis of what Jesus is saying, do something bold. Do something incredible. Don't let fear keep you from doing what God has called you to do. Don't let fear keep you from living out what God has called you to do and what he wants to do in and through your life. That resurrection of Jesus gives us a boldness and a courage to accomplish things that we never thought, never dreamed we could do on our own. Number two. The resurrection changes your perspective on the really hard stuff. Think of it like this. The family and the friends of Jesus, especially for those who gathered at the cross on Friday, it must have felt like it was the worst day in the history of the world. They saw the full display of hate and lies. They saw the evil of injustice and betrayal the rejection and mocking. 
They saw Jesus battered and bloody to body, nailed to a cross. They saw his suffering, heard his agony, and watched him die. And then Mark says, Joseph brought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb, which had been hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. It was a bad day. But now, three days later, Jesus has risen from the dead. He is alive, and and their perspective has changed. But, But be really clear about this. The resurrection did not change the pain of the cross. But the resurrection declared God is victorious. The joy of the resurrection overwhelmed their sadness. The resurrection allows us, in the middle of history, to get a glimpse of the end of history. And we know it's not always going to be this way. That that there is a victory in store that God wins. And, And you may be thinking, well, yeah, that's good news. But that's a future. What about here and now? What about the hard stuff I'm going through right now? Again, beloved, the resurrection has everything, everything to do with our life here and now. It changes our perspective. It doesn't mean the tough stuff isn't tough. It doesn't change Good Friday. It just uh, changes how we face those difficulties. Uh, It changes the way we look at them. We're still going to have them. It just changes the way we deal with them. For example, uh, Jesus said... These things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. Uh, In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. And we read that, and now it it has new meaning for us. It has a fuller meaning for us as we look at these verses through the cross and the empty tomb. Jesus has overcome. And so in the midst of messiness, in the midst of the brokenness of the sinful world... We have this extraordinary hope that the resurrection gives a glimpse of our future and the victory that is ours. And knowing that truth gives us a peace that would be impossible to have if our future was still in doubt. Now, let me give you some poor human analogies, but get the idea. Uh, um, a, A prisoner receives a sentence and one of the things that gives him that, that strength to make it through is he knows that there's an end in sight. It's not always going to be this way. There's some, that freedom is coming. Something better is coming. And the same is true for us. We are, are no longer prisoners of sin. There's a freedom in Christ. Again, as a pastor, I've seen a lot of brokenness. I've seen the way different people handle different Struggles. I've seen how they go through fear and anxiety and, and, and stress. I've seen how those who don't know Jesus deal with their uncertainty about the future. Uh, and so when they come across struggles and problems, it fills them with fear and anxiety and unrest. And at the same time, I've seen many people who are just just have such great confidence about the future that it changes the way they live in their present. They know what is in the end and what lies ahead. And because of that, I've seen them filled with joy and confidence and amazing comfort. Even having this wonderful, you know, as I've walked through people through some of their last steps of life, that they have this uh, just unique expectancy. Because they know, they just know something so much better is waiting. And so they faced incredible difficulties with incredible peace. This is what Paul did. Paul, the Apostle Paul, his his last words, facing imminent death, this is what Paul said. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not just to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. Like Paul, 
we have this eternal perspective. We know all our times are in God's hands and, and all we need to do is look at the cross and the empty tomb to get an idea of what God is willing to do on our behalf. Uh, if God loves us so much that he would give his son to die for us, and he did, what's he going to withhold from us? Everything compared to that is easy. And so we can say with Paul, for, for me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. And what that means, beloved, is that we live, oh, there it is, is that we live with a confident hope that we know even in our struggles that Jesus is with us and he's walking with us through the midst of these hard times and we are not alone therefore we have hope in fact Paul said for in hope we have been saved but hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he already sees you know hope is not just something in our head uh, it's not just a, a wishful thinking. It's this confidence that those of us who believe in Jesus have, who put our hope in him, that will one day experience this amazing, complete healing from this world of sin. We'll experience victory over sin and death. And that's why Jesus said, because I live, you also will live also. In other words, this is what it looks like. Jesus' victory is my victory. Jesus' life is my life. Jesus' hope is my hope. Jesus' future is my future. Which means then, for every single person who puts their hope in Christ, no matter what they're going through, no matter how hard it is, can still experience genuine peace and genuine confidence because Jesus is with me every step of the way. And the victory has already been won. And ultimately, ultimately, he wins. And because he wins, I win. We are so thankful in this resurrection weekend that reminds us that regardless of what we're going through in this earthly life, it's not going to change our future. We are heaven bound. And it does change then how we live in the presence with an eternal perspective, with a confident hope, with the peace that comes from knowing Christ is with us even to the end of the age. And he is risen. He is risen Hallelujah. And now may that peace that passes.